Okay, so last lesson we looked at a summary of various factors why the Nazi party uh, gained electoral support in the period 1930 to 32, but we, it's, it's important to remember that after that peak of 37%, 230 seats in July, the Nazi vote actually started to decline. And what helped Hitler to be appointed Chancellor in 1933 by Hindenburg, a man that did not like Hitler at all, was something called the Backstairs Intrigue uh, by the historian Alan Bullock. Basically, secret plans and plots get Hitler into power. As I've already said, here, this is actually a picture of Hitler um, being appointed Chancellor by Hindenburg. Uh, he obviously didn't say that at the time, but that is actually a criticism of Hitler by Hindenburg, little bohemian corporal. He had no love for Hitler. Uh, notice, actually, by the way, uh, Hitler's wearing civilian clothing. He's uh, bent over in an attitude of respect. He's appointed as Chancellor. He's not yet dictator. It's important to remember that in January 1933. Let's move on. So why did Hitler become Chancellor in January 1933? Well, clearly, obviously, Hindenburg appointed him. We know the Weimar Constitution. Uh, the, president, the President appoints the Chancellor. So they are actually supposed to... Uh, appoint the leader of the biggest party, which Hitler became, but Hindenburg actually actively avoided appointing Hitler for a while. So why was he eventually felt that he had to uh, appoint Hitler? What were his motivations and intentions? What was Hitler's strategy, uh, motivations and intentions as well, and in manoeuvring towards the chancellorship? And why did it happen when it did in January of 1933? So hopefully these questions will be answered. Well, let's look at some of the factors, summarise quickly some of the factors we looked at last time uh, and introduce perhaps some new ones. Well, uh, parliamentary government had broken down, if you remember, after 1913, Hindenburg was ruling by decree. He also, of course, had the power to appoint chancellors. Uh, and he appointed chancellors, of course, that, that, that did not represent a, a majority coalition because there simply wasn't one. During this time, the Nazi party was becoming popular in the elections over time. The thing is, as well, something else influencing Hindenburg are elite groups. He listens to these elite groups, and you should still make a note of these uh, if, you're doing, if you're studying GCSE history, that is. Uh, army officers, senior officers, big business are also interested as well. Senior civil servants, landowners, they wanted a return to strong authoritarian government. So this apparent breakdown of democracy, they didn't mind too much as long as they had somebody in charge they felt they could influence on control. And they influenced Hindenburg's political decisions in appointing chancellors. So these elite groups, uh, army, big business, etc., they're influencing Hindenburg's decisions and they want a return to strong authoritarian government. Sorry, this arrow represents influence. So let's have a look next at the succession of chancellors in the background of the Great Depression. Well, first of all, Heinrich Brüning of the Catholic Centre Party. He was in, appointed in 1930. Uh, he tried kind of austerity economics. I don't know if you've heard about those there in the news at the moment. Uh, and he became very unpopular during his time from 1930 to, to 1932. Unemployment reached that peak of six million. He was nicknamed the Hunger Chancellor which is uh, not something you really want to be nicknamed. So basically he gets booted out and fr uh, Franz Papen, Franz von Papen, aristocratic uh, Catholic and friend of Hindenburg becomes Chancellor in May of 1932. Now what he's hoping to do, because Parliament is basically in chaos, he's hoping to establish a government that has the support of the Nazis uh, for him as Chancellor and at least then they can get some popular support for the government within Germany if they, if they can include the Nazis, possibly in some sort of coalition. Problem is, uh, the, the, the Nazis don't listen to Franz von Papen. They want Hitler as Chancellor. He fails to win over the Nazis. He also annoys Hindenburg with some other decisions. And Franz von Papen is replaced by this man, Kurt von Schleicher. He is the next of the Article 48 Chancellors. He was a, an army officer, he was very much a man behind the scenes actually, whispering in Hindenburg's ear. And he has a plan now to become Chancellor by splitting the Nazi party. If you remember, back in 1926, the Bamberg Conference, uh, there was a left-wing part of the Nazi party, and this man Gregor Strasser was uh, a prominent figure in the left-wing um, sort of 
branch, as it were, or left-wing uh, part of the Nazi party. Now, what uh, Schleicher planned to do was uh, get Strasser in as vice-chancellor under him, uh, and hopefully get some union of left-wing Nazis with the trade unions and get some sort of functioning coalition together. Strasser approached Hitler saying, look, uh, I've got a chance to get in uh, uh, myself as a, a senior Nazi in government here. Uh, Hitler wasn't overly pleased with this, uh, told him no. Uh, Strasser then ultimately in 1934 would be uh, executed, shot, murdered, killed in the Night of the Long Knives. Not a good idea to uh, get in Hitler's way. So, the backstairs intrigue moves on. So, Schleicher, as we remember, uh, is um, appointed Chancellor in December of 1932. His plan fails. Now, Papen is highly resentful towards Schleicher, as he feels that Schleicher's kind of manoeuvred him out of the top political office. He wants to get back into power. Um, and what he's hoping is that if he supports Hitler's appointment as Chancellor, and himself as vice-chancellor, then basically there, there will be a strong government with popular support in the country. Because there's real fear now that because of this unstable government, these Article 48 chancellors, there could be some sort of popular revolution. Now, if, if Papen can get support from the Nazis, then at least they've got a government which shows itself having some degree of popular support. So, Papen brings this to um, Hindenburg. Basically, let's see, he says, let's form a majority of non-Nazis in the government, and basically we can get the support of the Nazis, but Hitler can be controlled. Um, Hindenburg, after the failure of uh, Schleicher and Papen himself, and, um, and uh, who was the hungry chancellor guy I've got? Bruding, basically agrees. So Schleicher is out and Hitler is appointed Chancellor in January 1933. So what were Hitler's intentions throughout this? Power by any democratic method and then to destroy democracy from within, especially if you can gain control of the army and the police. Uh, control of the army is clearly critical in controlling a country and establishing a dictatorship. What were Hindenburg's intentions? Well, he didn't really want to appoint Hitler. He refused twice. Uh, it was only after the failure of other chancellors to gain popular support that he appointed Hitler under pressure, thinking that Hitler could be controlled. Well, how did Hindenburg's sort of beliefs and ideas shape his intentions and actions? Well, you know, Hindenburg was, was a very aged, old um, right president. He was, you know, from the army. He was basically really a right-wing authoritarian figure. He'd been appointed as president, and for a while, you know, he fulfilled his duty. He didn't actively seek to undermine the Weimar democracy, but the circumstances of 1930 and the weak government played into his hands and other members of the elite. He was essentially authoritarian. He blocked laws to restrict Article 48. And it's obviously Article 48 that's key in getting Hitler appointed. So let's quickly have a quick recap. What were the circumstances which made Hitler a suitable candidate for Chancellor? The electoral success we looked at in the previous video, uh, the, the range of issues promoted in propaganda, a party for all, strong leadership, etc., targeting different voters, uh, unemployment being one of those key issues. Uh, again, some of the things, criticism of Versailles, presenting the communists as a threat, and the Nazis as the saviors of Germany from the threat of communism. Uh, impressive speeches at large rallies, very energetic posters, leaflets, etc. So, why January 1933? As we've already said, the political and economic elites, big business, senior army leaders, etc., they're looking for an authoritarian replacement for the Weimar Republic. They certainly do not anticipate a Nazi dictatorship. They are hoping that they can, after the failure of Schleicher, get in a puppet who can be controlled. And they influence Hindenburg's decision, leading to Hitler's appointment. Initially, he refuses, but he's forced to by the failure of other chancellors to appoint Hitler. His, hope, his hopes and their hopes, it's going to be a conservative government with Nazi support, but really dominated by the old-fashioned elites. They were to prove wrong. So, hope you can understand, uh, make notes on, you know, why Hindenburg appointed Hitler, that period of rule by decree and the Article 48 chancellors, the electoral success of the Nazis, this sort of merry-go-round, this carousel of brooding, not burning, sorry about that, I just noticed that mistake, but uh, brooding, Papen and Schleicher, 
uh, the fact that the Nazis don't support either Papen or Schleicher. The backstairs intrigue then, Papen hoping to get back into government, get his revenge on um, Schle uh, Schleicher, uh, hoping that they control the Nazis. And there's something of a fear of revolution, they need to get a government with some degree of popular support. And I hope you can explain but obviously, why Hitler is finally chosen by Hindenburg. So I hope you made some decent notes there, I hope that was useful. And uh, thank you very much.